This is an Amiga 1200 made by uh, Commodore Business Machines. And uh, this particular one is uh, an Amiga 1200 Revision 1D1. Uh, there were several other motherboard revisions. Um, this is a, it was a very nice Amiga uh, in the wedge style case. This is the motherboard, of course, so with the RF shield removed. And uh, here's some of the custom chips. There's Gale here, um, Budgie is here and uh, other custom chips in there too. Um, the uh, CPU is uh, on an accelerator card on this particular one, but here's the 6820, uh, which would have been the uh, main processor there. And uh, this particular one had an accelerator card in it. Uh, this is the uh, GVP uh, JAWS 2 accelerator, which gave it a, a faster uh, 6830, I believe it was a 40 megahertz uh, processor and another uh, 8 megs RAM as well as a battery backed up uh, real-time clock. And uh, we're going to try to reassemble this. Uh, this particular one uh, doesn't want to boot. It has uh, a hard drive problem. The hard drive, uh, it won't boot off the drive. So hopefully it's just a hard drive wasn't seated properly or something like that. Hopefully uh, when I get it back together it'll work properly. I think one thing that's kind of interesting on this particular motherboard, there's a, a very, it must have been a very last minute revision here. Uh, you can kind of see uh, green wire that comes off of one pin on that chip and goes to a pin on that chip. Uh, something that obviously wasn't uh, done in time to put the trace on the motherboard and they had to actually wire it in there. But uh, very clean motherboard otherwise, a compact machine for its day. And we'll try to put this back together. Uh, the first step is to replace the RF shield which uh, is held in by a series of tabs. Tuck that uh, cable for the floppy drive there through the RF shield and then carefully uh, put it back in place. Of course, all these computers that had plastic cases needed to have an RF shield to keep all the uh, RF interference issues uh, down to keep it with, get it within FCC compliance. Okay, here is the uh, two and a half inch hard drive. This is a 40 megabyte hard drive that uh, was factory installed. Uh, kind of interesting little mounting system. Uh, it uh, just These little tabs here just push right through holes in the motherboard. And it just lays in place right there. So you get it back in place, you have to kind of light those holes and just push a little harder than you'd like to. <laughs> it uh, doesn't feel real nice pushing something down onto the motherboard like that, but that holds it in place. And uh, uh, my warranty is void by opening the case. Although I don't think that's really an issue anymore. Okay, with the shell here, we can slide the back ports in through the holes in the back of the case. Put those in first, and then this will drop down into position inside the plastic shell there. Go ahead and put the floppy one in now if I can. Looks like the hole is lined up pretty good. So see if it'll go into position here. There it goes. Okay, now if I flip this over, there is a hole here that uh, goes through the case and the motherboard uses a different kind of screw because it goes into a metal clip. So we'll line up those holes and get that screw in. I believe we can lay the keyboard in. This is the Amiga 1200 keyboard. A uh, couple of blank keys on it. They're kind of interesting. One there and one there. Rather than just having the enter key come around and the shift key be longer like it is on most other Amiga keyboards, now it's got a couple of non functional keys. Put that ribbon cable in there and push down on the connector. 
and then the keyboard slides into place, uh, lays into some tabs or along the bottom edge, and rests on top of the uh, part of the mount for the hard drive. Top cover has a connector that goes down to the motherboard to run the uh, hard drive, floppy drive, and power LEDs. So that needs to be put into place here. There's kind of some tabs around the back that kind of snap into. It doesn't really hinge, but uh, should lay in place, and then by flipping it over, we can replace the rest of our screws. And then after we get the case in, we can install the accelerator card. There it goes. And it'll drop in there, and then the little door snaps in. Back together now. We'll have to see if it'll boot up. I'm going to go ahead and connect up all of the uh, ports here. There's a power connector. I'm going to leave the extra floppy out for now. There's a video connector. I'm going to leave the audio out for now. I'm going to plug in a joystick, and we'll just do the bare minimum. So the mouse is plugged in. Of course, the Amiga 1200 had the external brick power supply. And if I turn on my power strip down here, my monitor will come on. And this will be the moment of truth. We'll see if uh, we get any lights here. Hopefully, we'll see. Uh, hard drive lights going and we'll see a display. We'll reach down here and turn on the brick. Power supply. Power. Hard drive is spinning up. That's a good sign. And we've got hard drive activity. And here comes our display. It is booting. And there we are. There's our workbench. So this machine is again successfully running. Let's see what we have here for uh, hard drive is all intact. Unfortunately, the uh, Amiga 1200 and 4000 uh, did not have the uh, built-in deinterlacer with the 15-pin uh, uh, compact D-sub connector, so you cannot use a standard VGA uh, monitor with them. You have to use a RGB monitor or other equivalent with the 23-pin port in the back. About a million or so. Amiga 1200s were shipped before Commodore went out of business, and then they were bought by SCOM, uh, which also sold some Amiga 1200s. Unfortunately, they had some floppy drive uh, compatibility problems. SCOM went out of business as well, and then the Amiga 1200 was no more. So there it is, the Amiga 1200.